congratulations on making it here all in one piece and hopefully you're halfway warming up. Say yes. I still see, I still see coats on. Now, I was going to save this introduction for another program, but I think I'm going to use it here. I think that the speaker deserves a huge round of applause. Not only is she a very nice woman and she came here this evening to talk to us, she came from California, folks. <laughs> she left 70 degrees to come to, what was it this morning, two, three? So while we get started, I have a couple of messages and car uh, commercials. You all know these already by heart. There's a black box in the back of the room where we uh, gladly accept donations that help defer the costs of speakers. The Learned Owl will be here. I'm not sure that they're here yet, but they will be here this evening. Oh, they are here. Um, to sell books in the, after this program, and they, we will be in the rotunda for our traditional author signing reception. Many of you may or may not have seen this. This is the newest brochure of all the upcoming programs um, this spring. Most of these books I've kind of read. Um, last night we talked about eclipses. Anybody know why? Tonight we're talking about war animals. Tomorrow evening we're very fortunate to host Steven Pinker, who is considered to be one of the, well, Bill Gates called his book his new favorite book of all time. Um, He's a linguist and he sort of talks about health, prosperity, safety, all in one big ball of wax. Uh, it's called Enlightenment Now, that's tomorrow evening. I just finished the book American Eden, David Hasek, Botany and the Medicine in the Garden of the Early Republic. In case you don't know, David Hasek was the physician that attended Alexander Hamilton during the very famous duel with he and Aaron Burr. David Hasek is one of the very first botanists and physicians in the United States, and it's a phenomenal book. On St. Valentine's Day, you can all have a date if you want, with um, the now retired, I guess he's retired, um, Senator Flake, Jeff Flake from Arizona. I was going to use that um, brave person because he's coming from Arizona to Ohio. Um, <laughs> that's St. Valentine's Day. Finding Dorothy, a good dear friend of ours, Elizabeth Letts, returns, and this is a great book about women's suffrage and um, The Wizard of Oz. And believe it or not, there is a commonality historically for this book, and it's a great book to read. I loved it. Uh, Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction, which is Judith Gazelle's, Grizel's book. Later, we have Under Pressure and Lisa Damore. I don't know if you know this or not, but she's a Cleveland native. Uh, we're very fortunate to have um, Edward Watts coming in in his book, Mortal Republic, How Rome Fell into Tyranny. There are a lot of similarities painted in his book between Rome and its fall into tyranny and our current political climate. Um, he is coming in March, and the Women's Hour um, to, so to commemorate the centennial of women's suffrage, it's also a great book. She's coming in March. There's a novel of the Vanderbilts that's coming in April. Um, H.W. Brands has been here several times before. He's always on the History Channel. He's written one about the epic rivalry of Henry Clay, John Calhoun, and Daniel Webster. It is a great book. I finished it about a, three weeks ago. And then Dutch Girl. Did everybody know that Audrey Hepburn was Dutch? And she's actually of, um, I don't want to say royalty, but certainly aristocracy. In, in, um, and she participated in World War II as a teenager and Dutch girl, Audrey Hepburn in World War II, that will be in May. There are also a couple of others that aren't in this brochure that will come out in the next brochure. One of them is about, I gotta get the right fish here. We overfish and the, oh help me, what's the, in the Lake Erie we worry about the, what fish coming up into, the carp, the Asian carp, there are within four miles of entering the Great Lakes now. And so there's a great book coming out called Overrun about the Asian carp infiltrating the Great Lakes. He's coming in the spring. And I gotta think of the other one that I just booked. I don't know, they come and go and I can't read them fast enough. Nonetheless, pick up the brochure. I'm putting them outside on the benches and I'll also put them in the rotunda. Please take a moment and sign up for the ones that you want to or ask the librarians to sign you up, we'll happily do so. And I hope you have a great spring reading these wonderful books and meeting these great people.
Speaking of great people, forgive me, Robin, will you get your phone? I'm going to ask Bill to stand up and turn around. Stand up and turn around. You guys are all from this area, I hope, and so is he. So I've got to find out if you recognize him. This is, anybody remember him? Tell, what was your character on TV? Mr. Pokey, he used to be, and his dog po uh, Smokey was on TV. He was on TV for many years. Um, this is a Bill Wynn, am I saying it correctly? And he um, had a dog, Smokey, and they went to war together. And we're very fortunate. He's written two books. They have just produced a film about him, which will debut at how many film festivals, did you tell me? 150 film festivals. You guys are actually going to, what's the one in Colorado? Sundance. They're going to sand, Sundance as well. And you, thank you. I thought it was Colorado. Tell, it's in Utah. I stand corrected. All of that being said, he's a very dear friend of our author this evening, Robin Hutton. And as I told you, she hails from California. <laughs> she has written two phenomenal books. I gotta get my glasses again and read these things. Sergeant Reckless, America's War Horse. I don't know if any of you have read that, but it was, it was quite the book. And War Animals is her latest. And tonight she's gonna discuss war animals that tell the animal heroes of World War II. Um, she was deeply involved with writing and producing things out in California. She is the president of Angels Without Wings, which is a 503 non nonprofit corporation that spearheaded the development and dedication of a national memorial to Sergeant Reckless. She told me at dinner she is deeply involved and on her way to Washington to champion a, a museum for war animals, an international war museum, international museum, so it's all animals, not just American. Um, and she has been honored as the Patriotic Citizen of the Year by her local chapter of the Military Order of World, War, World Wars and the Military Order of the Purple Heart for her charitable work. She hails from Colorado, and we will have copies available of War Animals this evening for signing in the rotunda, so make sure you come into the rotunda. One other little comment. Remember these things? Please take a moment and either mute them or turn them down a little because they're sort of a pain in the butt. Well, you got yours muted, right? <laughs> so all that being said, here's Robin. Thank you, Gwen, and thank you everybody for coming out tonight. I, I always get so excited when I come to talk to a group because I know each and every one of you are going to walk out tonight after hearing these stories of these animals and you're going to have a smile on your heart and a skip in your step because you're going to learn about some really cool animals and their stories throughout history and the heroics that uh, they have done for our um, soldiers throughout time. Now with Sergeant Reckless, does anybody here know about Sergeant Reckless? Oh wow, okay, well that's pretty good. Um, Sergeant Reckless, I'll start with her story first because she's the one that led me into the uh, War Animals book. So Sergeant Reckless disappeared from the pages of history. She was actually America's greatest war horse. She served during the Korean War. Uh, a Marine purchased her to carry ammunition during the war for his platoon and she carried rounds of recoilless rifle ammunition and each round was 24 pounds. In 1997, Life Magazine listed her as one of our all-time greatest heroes with Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, Mother Teresa. It's amazing what this horse has done and none of you had ever heard about her. She's just stunning. She became a Marine in 1952 and you can see this is the gun that she carried the ammunition for. And she would carry up to eight to ten rounds on her back depending on the, the battle. And um, she was just a little pony. She was only 13 hands high, but she was incredibly mighty. So when Eric Pedersen, the gentleman there, that's Eric Pedersen, he purchased her for $250 of his own money to uh, help his platoon. And she had never worked, uh, she had carried uh, rice, uh, bags of rice uh, with the young Korean man who owned her previously. And he actually, the only reason he sold his beloved horse 
to the Marines for $250 was to buy an artificial leg for his sister who lost hers in a landmine accident. And so Reckless became a Marine in October of 1952, and it's amazing what she did. But she had to be taught to get in and out of the trailer. That's what she rode around in. And it's amazing that this little horse could do that, but she'd get in there and she'd steady herself and everything. And <clears throat> she would, was taught to lay down in her bunker um, when she would uh, run from incoming. They would say, incoming, incoming, and she would run and get down, knew how to get down and stuff. They taught her to climb up uh, underneath um, communication wire. It was just amazing what they had to teach her. And she was an amazingly smart horse. <clears throat> she, the Marines so loved this little horse that she would sleep in their tents at night. And uh, she drank beer with them, even. Uh, and, and she loved her beer. Oh my God, she loved her beer. She also loved Coca-Cola and she'd eat Hershey bars. She'd eat just about anything, as you'll hear in a minute. But here she is drinking a beer. And uh, she was just beloved, but they let her sleep in their tents at night because she didn't like to be alone. The Marines had become her herd, and she would follow them anywhere. And it was just a cra amazing, the love story. This picture uh, astounds me because you can see, hopefully, can you see the pictures okay with the light? You can see how small she is. Now her back is actually right there, but that's how small this little horse was. And when you see the rounds of ammunition that she carried on her back, it's astounding. It took three men to carry the gun itself. And she would carry these rounds of ammunition um, by herself. In her most heroic battle, ah, there we go. Thank you. In her most heroic battle in March of 1953, she had a couple of skirmishes before this one. But in her most heroic battle, she made 51 round trips, most of the time by herself, up to the guns and back, carrying eight, at least eight rounds at a time on her back. It was astonishing what she did. Um, she would, um, they would load her up, they'd give her a slap on her rump, she'd go up the hill. Now they had to show her the way every couple of times in, in the beginning because, um, you know, they did, she wasn't sure where the guns were, but they would show her the way and she got to know where the men were and she'd go up there by herself. And they were hopscotching around the hill because this gun had a terrible back blast and it would det it detect to the enemy where the men were firing from. And so she would uh, take these rounds up by herself, they'd take them off of her, give her a slap and down the hill she'd go. She even carried wounded off the battlefield and she did this 51 times. She walked over 35 miles up and down these steep hills. She carried over 9,000 pounds on her back. She carried 386 rounds during this one battle. It was phenomenal what this horse did. And it was so bad, the incoming and outgoing shells were so bad, they were colliding midair and raining down on the troops like fireworks, you know? And she actually got wounded twice. She was wounded in her forehead and in her left flank from falling shrapnel. And it was just stunning what she, what she did. But she, um, she was just this phenomenal horse that the Marines beloved. Because of what she did in the Battle of Outpost Vegas in March of 53, the war ended just a few months later and uh, she helped break the backbone of the Chinese and the enemy during, uh, during that battle. So on July 53, there she is sharing beer with one of her compatriots, and uh, it was said that she got a little hammered that night. <laughs> In my book on Sergeant Reckless, I have one of the guys talk about how he saw her kind of staggering around you know, the base that night like everybody else because they were so happy that the armistice had been signed. But here she is uh, when, uh, uh, when the war ended. And the gentleman feeding her beer is Colonel Andrew um, Gear, And Gear was the man who wrote the very first book on her. He actually wrote a story about her in the Saturday Evening Post that got people to know her story. She was promoted to sergeant, actually promoted to sergeant in uh, April of 1954. And they even built a stand that, that amazes me here is they built a, a platform in Korea to have, I mean, they honored this horse like one of their own. 
and they promoted her to sergeant. They had her lead uh, through the troops, so everybody saluted her, and she had this formal promotion to sergeant. So Andrew Gere's story in the Saturday Evening Post, this is the picture that was in the book, in the magazine. And you can see there, the, these are the rounds of ammunition she carried. Now, she carried, as I said, eight of those at a time. You could just imagine how loaded down with this she was. But <clears throat> when the, the story came out, she was still stuck on the hills of South Korea. And uh, there was a national outcry to get her home because all of her men had come home. But the Marines didn't want it to look like a promotional thing to bring this horse home, so they couldn't put money into it. So Andrew Gear raised $1,200 of his own money. He got her a, um, uh, when the story came out, the head of a shipping line called him up, and he said, if you can get her to Japan, I can get her home, free shipping. Um, we just need you to have a, a, you know, a, st a stall for her and uh, hay, but we'll get her home. And so he, he agreed to pay $1,200 of his own money. And on November 10th, 1954, which happened to be Marine, Marine Corps birthday, she lands in America. And this is her first steps getting on American soil right here. You can see them loading her off the deck and everything. And this is the first time and, uh, Eric Pedersen saw her since he left her a year and a half earlier in, uh, in Korea. Uh, and so he was just thrilled to be able to bring her home. When she landed, she had more press show up for her landing than then Vice President Richard Nixon did the week before at a press conference. So she had a bigger draw at this. And um, on her way home, she ate her blanket, so they had to get her a new blanket. As I said, she'd eat anything. Uh, so she ate her blanket, so she had to get new ribbons, new chevrons, and a new blanket to meet her the press, you know, and to meet her audience. So from the press conference there, she was billet, uh, taken across town to the Marines Memorial Club in San Francisco, where she was the belle of the ball, the Marine Corps birthday ball that year. And um, when she sashayed off the elevator, she goes through the elevator, had to adjust herself in the elevator because she was so big. Um, she uh, adjusted herself, took ten, went up to the 10th floor, walked out, sashayed into the um, event, and they said that there were, the flash bulbs were going off like mortar shells. There were so many people taking her picture. She spied the anniversary cake and it was up to her nostrils in it before the guys could get her away from it. And uh, she was just the belle of the ball that night. And then the next day, she went to Camp Pendleton where she lived out her days and is buried. And um, she was promoted twice uh, at Camp Pendleton, both times to staff sergeant. This is the first one she was promoted. The gentleman who was reading uh, her story, uh, you know, promoting her, in my book he talks about how he had to stand there and read the citation as if he was promoting another uh, a Marine to staff sergeant. He said, we treated her as our own and it was just amazing. And they had the, the full parade of the troops and the band and everything and she's there with her little Colt Fearless right there is standing by his mom as she's promoted the first time. Uh, the second time she was promoted was by the Commandant of the Marine Corps. He flew out to California to promote her the second and last time in 1959. They had a 21 gun salute in his honor, a parade of 1500 troops turned out for this, and she was just the belle of the ball and there's little Fearless right there. Um, and Dauntless also showed up for that one as well. But uh, it was just amazing how they treated her. She's the only animal to hold an official ranking in any branch of the military. And she was a staff sergeant. If she outranked you, you could not lead her in a parade. So it was really quite amazing how they honored this ranking. She retired in 1960. Um, the gentleman feeding her cake here told me that it was the first time he handled her. And when she was gone, she looked back at her troops and kind of did this whinny like, I don't want to go. But she, um, she lived out her days and uh, finally um, she had three colts at Camp Pendleton. Two of them, Dauntless and Fearless, were amazing rodeo horses for the Navy rodeo. And um, they also are buried at Camp Pendleton. Chesty was adopted. He was a little bit of a wild thing. 
but he was named after Chesty Puller, so I guess that was kind of the breeding. But, um, and she died in May of 1968. And it was just amazing. When she died, her story was across uh, front page on most newspapers across the country. I mean, she was as famous as Lassie and Rin Tin Tin in her day. And it was just amazing what um, she, she did. I've spent the last five years, since 2013, putting monuments in for her. The first one is at Quantico at the National Museum of the Marine Corps. That's the Commandant of the Marine Corps there saluting, saluting her. The second one down here is at Camp Pendleton that we did in 2016. So that's where she retired and is buried. And then this one we just did in May uh, of last year, 2018. Um, that's at the Kentucky Horse Park. So she's standing among the greatest horses of all time with Man of War, Secretariat, um, and all of the great horses there. And it's just been this amazing, amazing journey. And we're dedicating three of more monuments to her this year. So it's really kind of cool. Her story just continues to spread. Now in 2016, <clears throat> I had discovered a medal that the British give out. It's called the Dickon Medal. And the Dickon Medal is the greatest award an animal can receive for gallantry and bravery in a military conflict. And so um, it started in World War II, and at that time, 32 pigeons, eight, uh, 18 dogs, three horses, and a cat had won this medal. <laughs> so I, these, these stories are amazing, and um, uh, I applied for this, and I was able to get Reckless to be the fourth horse in history to receive the PDSA Dickon Medal. And um, so we went over, this lady here is the, the gal who gave us the Reckless the Medal, is the queen cousin, Princess Alexandra. And it was just an amazing day. But in learning about this medal, that's when I came to learn about those 32 pigeons, 18 dogs, three horses, and a cat who are now in my new book on war animals. So it's just been this amazing, amazing ride. And uh, when I was going over to get the medal, I had my publisher, I said, I need a little press release here, you know? And um, I, he says, well, and I sent him the information and he writes me back and he says, well, these, there's some great stories here. And I said, well, that's what I tried to tell you because my next book after I did Reckless, I wanted to do a book called Warbirds because these pigeons are amazing. And um, I pitched it to him, he says, nah, they're not warm and fuzzy like dogs and horses. And I was crushed, you know? So I said, but they're really cool birds. And uh, so when he came up with this idea, when it was his idea, I jumped on it, and I said, I'll have a proposal to you in a week. And uh, he bought it, and uh, he just uh, absolutely fell in love with it. So this started me on this journey to learn all about these amazing animals of World War II. Now, what many of you, or most of you probably don't know, I did not know this, that when war broke out, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, we did not have a war dog program. And uh, it was just an amazing period of time. But this woman right here, Arlene Erlanger, knew that the dogs needed to play a role in um, guarding our defenses, uh, munitions plants, airports, you name it. Uh, we needed to step up our security on our borders because this was just too, getting too scary. And she called her dog friends, her dog fancier friends from the American Kennel Club and, and uh, everything, and they started Dogs for Defense. And Dogs for Defense was set up in January of 1943. And um, it was, a, they put out a national announcement to donate your dogs to help secure America. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but there's no way I'm going to let my Misty go to war. But they had 40,000 dogs donated to the, the movement. Now, of course, not all of them made the cut. Some of them were too old, some of them were sick, some of them were too small, not the right breed. But they took 20,000 dogs in the first cut and over 10,425 dogs actually went into training and went into either the services over in Europe 
or guarding, most of them stayed here and guarded our coastlines with the Coast Guard and uh, different uh, munitions plants, airports, and things like that. But it was amazing. This lady here is Roosevelt's cousin. And they had a dog fund where the dogs that couldn't make it um, to be donated, but they still needed um, money and support and everything, they come up, came up with the war dog fund. So if you paid a dollar, your dog could be enlisted in the war dog patrol. It was the canine corps, they called it. And uh, your dog could be enlisted to, um, as a private. And the money, monies went up. So if you donated $100, your dog could be either a general or an admiral. And so it was a wonderful thing. And it didn't have to be just dogs. You know, they had turtles, they had cats, they had hamsters. But that's how they raised money and could get everybody involved in this movement. And uh, so it was just amazing. But this is Greer Garson donated one of her poodles. And uh, Richie Valley, he donated his dog, uh, Butch, I think his name was. I can't really remember his name, but he donated that dog, so that's why he's got this puzzled look on his face, I think, like, what do you mean? Where am I going? But it was amazing what they did during that time. And when the dogs were taken in, there were five locations around the country that were training um, operations. Fort Robinson, Nebraska was one, and uh, they're all over Fort Belvoir, Virginia and everything, but these dogs had to go through inspection. They were weighed, and you could see the St. Bernards. They had all kinds of breeds, and finally they had to, as training went on, they would whittle them down, and they went from 32 breeds originally to five breeds that uh, were the most acceptable, which were the German Shepherds, the Belgian Malinois, the Doberman Pinscher, Labradors, um, Collies, and uh, Huskies, I think they were. But um, they all had to be put through their paces and trained. And uh, here they're putting them through, telling them to stay and stuff. This is the kennel at Fort Robinson, right down here. But depending on what the dog had to do, if he was a guard dog or a sentry dog, he was trained to attack. Um, if he was a scout dog, they were trained to do silent patrols where they couldn't bark. So like with this one, the... Um, the bad guy comes out, they had to, to train, you know, who were the enemy. And so the dogs had to be really put through their paces with all of this to kind of learn about um, what was needed and what was expected of them. But there's no way to prepare these animals for war with all the incoming and outgoing of the sounds of battle, the weather, the ships, you know, how many of them got seasick on ships. It was, it was just amazing. But to be put through these paces was really something else. In the meantime, uh, Dogs for Defense was um, training these dogs. The Marine Corps, at the same time, decided to have their own training program. And this training was set up at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And they had over 1,100 dogs that ultimately went through their program. And these dogs served mainly in the Pacific. And, um, and you can see here the going through training. Um, this dog here, what was amazing about the Marine Corps and what I loved about the Marine Corps was that they had a book for every dog that was put through um, their paces. And so you're able to go to the National Archives and look at these dog books. And when I got to the archives and I'm pulling out these dogs I had been reading about and I'm actually looking at their handler's notes in these books, I, I sobbed. I just sat there and sobbed as I'm looking at these real pieces of history as these dogs come alive. And you see their stories and you understand what amazing things they did. Two of these dogs here are in my book. This is Jack. Jack became a messenger dog. So here he is learning how to carry a message on uh, a capsule on his neck. And uh, two people would handle, or handle the messenger dogs at a time because you had to have one take take the dog out to point, and then put the message in, and then he had to go back, to report to the other handler. And so that was a two-time, uh, a two, uh, two handler thing. This dog, Andy, became a silent scout dog. But here you are seeing how they scaled the walls and had to scale these things on their own, and they were put through their paces. 
Here, they're being taught how to land off of a, a big um, Higgins boat down into the smaller um, uh, boats that would take the animals to shore um, to, uh, in the Pacific. And then the, the middle two pictures here just show some of the training, trying to get them used to the smoke and to the gunfire and everything. But as I said, there's no way really that you can prepare these dogs for what they were about to face. Now most of the animals that I said went through the um, a training at, uh, th through Dogs for Defense in the Army, they served on the home front. A lot of them served on, uh, in Europe, but most of them served on the home front. And they served with the Coast Guard, and here you can see some of these great pictures. I mean, the book, my book is filled with over 150 pictures of all of these dogs and everything. But to see them uh, with what they do, and you can see here, I love an Afghan hound. Is, is there, she guarded um, one of the airports, uh, it was one of the first ones to guard an airport in New Jersey. And they're training them to, um, as sentry dogs, as scout dogs, and everything. And back in World War II, well, the, one of the things that happened with this, um, in um, 19, June of 1943, I believe it was, um, it was called Operation Pastorius. And what happened was four Germans were dropped off off the shores of, um, a, a Magaset, um, New York, and they went ashore, and uh, they had enough ammunitions and money to wreak havoc on America from the inside. They were going to blow up the Alcola factory. They were going to hit Niagara with the electricity. They had over $170,000 with them to uh, to um, really attack America from inside. Four other men were dropped off off the shores of Florida. And um, one little Coast Guardsman discovered these men, and he kind of uh, tried to just uh, take a bribe from them and kind of walk away. But thankfully, he was able to get help, and um, these men were picked up within eight days of when being discovered that they had made these landings. It was the biggest manhunt in F FBI history at the time. And, uh, but that made everybody fear that something else like Pearl Harbor was going to take place. And so that's why they stepped up the Coast Guard on guarding the beaches with the dogs and the horses and guarding our coastlines. Over 3,000 miles of coastlines were guarded during World War II with uh, the animal patrols. So these are some of the dogs on the war front. And it's amazing what these dogs uh, were doing. The dogs here up in the top picture are from the first Marine War Dog Platoon. And uh, in my book, as I said, I have all of the Dickin Medal winners. Most of those are British medal winners. But I also had to give it an American feel, so I have uh, uh, stories on the first Marine War Dog Platoon and uh, what they did. But um, uh, you can see here that this dog here is Caesar, and I'll get to Caesar's story in a minute. Um, he was just this, uh, the very first messenger dog that carried a message um, in uh, Bougainville when they landed on Bougainville. This dog here is Judy. Judy to me is the heart of the book. This beautiful English pointer was actually the very first prisoner of war dog. She served in the Japanese prisoner of war camps for three years and she survived. And the, her story is just phenomenal. She survived the war. Most of the animals in my book have happy endings because um, I, I just couldn't take the sad <laughs> endings. So I, I had really good happy endings. Judy survived the war. That man with her claimed her in the prisoner of war camp. The mantra in the camp was, if Judy can make it, so can I. And the men contribute to her the fact that they survived these Japanese war camps. And uh, her story is just amazing what she went through. This little dog here is Rip. That's after a bombing in the Blitz of London. And Rip was one that could detect bodies underneath the rubble. And there's uh, seven stories of dogs that were so heroic that won the Dickin Medal that were called the Digging Dogs. And one was Beauty. Her skill was learning how to find animals in the rubble. She even found a goldfish, you know, which was amazing. Um, there was one jet, cracks me up, 
he was digging in the, um, in the rubble, and all of a sudden he hears somebody swearing like a sailor at him. And so he starts digging and digging, and then all the men come and start digging and digging. Well, they finally find a parrot who starts swearing at him like, you know, like a sailor, you know, but they saved this parrot. And it was just delightful, you know. And so you have those kind of moments, you know, that bring levity to the horrors of war and, um, and the history, but it's, it's just amazing. And this little dog here is Smokey, who my very dear friend Bill Wynn here, that's his dog that was discovered in a foxhole in New Guinea, and I'll get to Smokey's story in a moment, um, discovered in a foxhole and became the very first therapy dog. And it's just stunning what this little dog did. And uh, this is Antis. Uh, he was actually uh, rode in the, the planes uh, and he could detect a plane coming in uh, and a bombing raid before the men could hear it. It was amazing what this dog did. And then there's Chips, and I'll tell you about Chips' story in a moment here, too, because Chips was the most decorated dog in American history, and he still is the greatest American dog in history as far as medals go. Chips was received the Silver Star for his, his bravery during the invasion of Sicily. And this is a great picture of him. <clears throat> what he did was um, uh, he was involved in three big events. One was the very first landing in Africa called Operation Torch. And um, that was uh, uh, on the shores of Casablanca, in, in northern Africa, and stuff. And that was when he made his very first landing. That was the very first landing that America was in. And uh, he was on there, and there's not much written about that story. But in January of uh, 1943, he guarded President Roosevelt and Winston Churchill for 10 days during the Casablanca Conference. And um, he stood very steady at the helm. He met the two men, even met Charles de Gaulle and everything. And uh, it was just amazing what this little dog did in, in guarding these um, heads of state during this conference. But his big moment came during the invasion of Sicily on June 10th, 1943 in Operation Husky. And uh, the boats were landing, there was a, a three-prong attack and he was in the northern part um, in a little town called Lakata. And um, when the ships landed at dawn and the guys got off, they were attacked by a machine gun nest uh, just um, off the beach. And so the men started digging their holes and everything to try to um, get cover and Chips broke free of his handler, charged the, uh, the, the machine gun nest, got the gunner by the throat. The men heard shots inside the gun hut, so they feared the worst. Um, suddenly, Chips pulls the guy out of the hut with three Italian soldiers, hands up, and surrender. They were more afraid of the dog than they were of being shot. And um, because he silenced this machine gun nest, the men were able to advance the farthest than anyone else that day. He was wounded twice in there. He was, um, he was actually cited for a distinguished service cross, but they didn't honor animals that way. But uh, uh, Major uh, Lucien Truscott uh, decided to put all of that aside, and he was actually awarded the Silver Star, which is the third highest medal that you could receive for bravery in action and he was also up for a Purple Heart. But because he was a dog, he actually got the Silver Star. He was awarded the Silver Star on the battlefield, had the Silver Star, but because he was a dog, the military order of World Wars, the head of that, complained to Congress and they revoked his medals. And so it was very, very sad. But um, uh, he survived the war and uh, here he is coming home um, in a railway station, and here he is when he landed at home, and this is the family that gave him up for war, the Wren family. And little Johnny Wren was four years old when his war dog came home. And it's just amazing to hear the stories of little Johnny Wren, and there's one where he was so proud to have his war dog home that he'd be marching around town and having his little army uniform on and saluting everybody with his rifle and stuff, you know. And one day, a friend of his came running out of his house with a cap gun towards Chips. And I said, oh my God, did he bite him? And he said, no, it's kind of like a growl and a snap. And he got the gun away from him, and the kid went crying inside. 
but you know, it's it scared the, the the community that there's this vicious war dog. But it it you know he's, he's, he deserved it actually. But anyway, so remember how I got the Dickin Medal for Reckless? Well, I nominated Chips for a Dickin Medal, and a year ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, on January 14th of 2018, little Johnny Wren goes with me to England and gets the Dickin Medal for his dog, war dog Chips. And it was just a great, great day. This dog, Aaron here, is, was stunning as he wore the uh, Chips' posthumous medal. But it was just a wonderful day of celebration that this was the one medal that he was able to, to keep. And uh, it was just uh, a great, great day. Uh, and Chips lived for about seven or eight months after he came home and then died of complications, they think, from his kidneys. He'd fallen off the truck and, and stuff. But uh, it was just, uh, he's just a great, great dog. So the first Marine War Dog Platoon, this is the first uh, group of Marine dogs that stormed the beaches of Bougainville in the Pacific. And there were three messenger dogs. There was Thor, Caesar, and Jack. And then the rest were Doberman Pinschers. Uh, there were 21, uh, 21 Doberman Pinschers and three German Shepherds in this platoon. And they were trying to be either messenger dogs, scout patrol dogs, or casualty dogs. And Caesar was the very first dog that got wounded in uh, battle with the Marines. And um, Caesar was a messenger dog, and he made the landing very successfully and was carrying messages back and forth. And then uh, the third day, uh, the Japanese were trying to sneak into camp. And the, um, as Caesar heard them. And so he jumped up out of the foxhole with his handler and charged the Japanese enemy. And when his handler heard what was happening, he called the dog back and he was hit in the back and he was hit twice by a sniper's bullet. And so they were just devastated. But uh, they were able to make a makeshift uh, sling for him and carried him back to safety. And uh, he uh, survived his, uh, he went through surgery. They got rid of one of the bullets, but the one closest to his heart, they couldn't remove. But three weeks later, he was running messages again, and it was just amazing what this dog did. They took such care of these animals over there. It was really, really something to, uh, something to see what they did. And uh, you can see here, um, oops, uh, this picture of when uh, he's being x-rayed and stuff, the, the love and the care that they give, gave to these animals and everything. Um, but uh, he was just a, a great dog. Sadly, he did not survive the war. His is the only dog book that I went through that had pages missing. So I don't really know what happened to him. All I did know was I saw on the one page that said he was killed in action on Okinawa. And, uh, but his was the only one that uh, I couldn't get a copy of. So Jack is this really cool dog who was also a messenger dog. And this handler here, if you go to foxnews.com and Google Jack the War Dog, this is Homer Finley, who is 93 years old, and um, his story is on there talking about when he handled the War Dog Jack. <coughs> and it's just an amazing story how Jack was a messenger dog. And um, what Jack's claim to fame was is that the men in his unit, before Homer Finley became his handler, was, he was handled by a man named Gordon Wortman. And they were on uh, a, a patrol in uh, uh, Bougainville. And um, they, were, they got surrounded by the enemy. And <clears throat> they had to, lines were cut, so they couldn't get messages back to headquarters that they needed help. They needed stretchers and they needed support. Jack was the only um, way they could do it. But he had been shot with his handler, and Jack had a bullet that went through his back, really creased his back deeply, and he was bleeding pretty badly. And so the um, commanding officer of the platoon crawled over to Gordon Wortman and said, your dogs are only hope, do you think he could make it? And Gordon said, he's got a lot of guts, sir, I think he can. So he put a message in, and um, he, he just said to Jack, you know, buddy, you gotta do this, report to Paul. 
And off Jack looked at him, got the nerve to get up, and he made it all the way back with the message, and the men were saved. And so was uh, Gordon and everybody. So he's, he's just this wonderful, amazing dog. And Homer tells the story. He survived the war, and Homer tells the story of when he got back after the war and he was going through Lejeune, he finds Jack in the cage. They were detraining him to go home, go back home. And um, Homer says, oh my God, that's the dog I, I handled. And they said, oh, don't go in there, sir. You know, he's mean. He won't let anybody near him. And the guy says, well, if I, know, if I know Jack, he'll let me in. He said, I walk in there. Jack ran over to me, toppled me, started licking my face. And he said, you know, it was the best day of my life, of my dog handling days that this dog did this. And so people were amazed that this dog did this to me. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful story. Andy was a scout patrol dog. He uh, was just this amazing uh, dog. He was probably the best scout that they had. Um, he could go in and uh, he could go off leash. He would go off on his own. And by the time he froze and just stood there, he couldn't growl, he couldn't bark, he couldn't do anything. But he could notify the, the men. Uh, his handlers knew exactly what his tails were. And so he was able to, um, they were uh, going up the Piva Trail trying to clear some brush and stuff. And there was an ambush waiting for the men to come in. And uh, they were both on either side. And um, uh, they were gonna do like a, a crisscross shooting. So if the tanks came in or the men came through, they were gonna hit them on both sides. And Andy was able to spot the gun, uh, machine gun nests. And um, they called in for help and the tanks came in and sadly they hit uh, a mine and one of the, the wheels blew off of a tank. Um, but uh, the men were there and they were able to uh, throw hand grenades into the machine gun nests and kill the snipers. And all of that was because of Andy's amazing detection of uh, what he was able to do and smelling, you know, the threat uh, of the men. It's, these stories are just phenomenal. And here is little Smokey. Smokey was found in a foxhole in New Guinea. And how she landed there is anyone's guess, but Bill writes beautifully about it in his book called um, Smokey, it was uh, Yorkie Doodle Dandy. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I really encourage you to get it on Amazon. It's, it's just a delightful book. But Smokey became the very first therapy dog and Bill was sick. Here is handsome Bill right here. Bill was sick with dengue fever, and Smokey was able to come there and um, visit him, and the nurses fell so in love with him, and Dr. Mayo, who was the, was it the son of the Mayo, the doctor that built the Mayo Clinic? Um, he was there, and he let Smokey go and visit the other men in the hospital, and she was such a hit and made them feel so much better that they would travel and uh, um, afterwards uh, the war and Bill would take her to other hospitals and uh, everything working with the uh, wounded uh, soldiers and stuff. But she was this amazing dog, but what she did was phenomenal. This picture up here, she saved the day in Luzon, Philippines, when she strung 70 feet of communication wire through this eight inch pipe. She had, they, they tied a string to her collar and Bill got on the other side of the landing um, uh, field and because uh, they were, if they couldn't do it this way, they were gonna have to tear it up. They were gonna have to move the planes. Um, the planes would be in jeopardy of being spotted. Uh, the men would be in jeopardy of being hit, de you know, killed. And so they, this was their only hope. And she walked through this tunnel Sometimes it was only four inches high because the sand had seeped into the cracks of the, uh, uh, the joists between the pipes. And she was able to string this communication wire through that, um, that pipe and save the day. And it's just amazing what this little dog did. And she actually has um, eight monuments around the world. And there's two more that are coming, right? Do I have that number right? 12, 12 and, and three coming, three in Australia. So it's just amazing. And you see the, the monument is her in this little helmet and it's the cutest darn thing. They have it up at the Cleveland Metro Parks, a little monument to her and it's, it's just amazing. 
And what is so cute about it is this picture down here, Sinbad's story is also in my book. He was a mascot for the Coast Guard. And um, so when Sinbad was on tour with his book, he met up with Bill and Smokey and they had a photo op together as war dogs, which I think is just the cutest thing. And if you get my book here tonight, Bill has graciously said that he will sign his little smoky section as well because her story and pictures, there's a lot more pictures in the book than are up here on her story. It's just an amazing, amazing little story. So, in World War II, the warbirds, the warbirds, the pigeons, you will never look at a pigeon the same after you read this book. I swear they are not rats with wings. They are amazing, amazing animals. And, you know, in World War I, they were first used as kind of spies. They had cameras put on their chest to do aerial photography. And uh, it was amazing how they um, were developed dur during World War I and II, and then I think the CIA was even trying to use them up until the 60s. But they would carry these capsules, the bigger capsules would be on their back for photographs and maps and stuff, or you can't see it probably here, but down here, the capsule on the leg where they would have these messages. And they were fl uh, flown, uh, thrown out of planes. They were dropped by themselves behind enemy lines to get uh, as spies, to get um, um, information during the French resistance. Um, it was just amazing. And um, the very first bird to win the Dickin Medal was Winky. And uh, he saved the lives of a whole uh, airplane crew that went down. And uh, he was able to um, get back and let the people know where the plane had, had crashed. He didn't have a message on his leg, but they could tell by the oil. And uh, when he returned back and from the last message, how far the bl uh, bird had flown and that they were actually looking in the wrong place for the downed plane. So they switched their um, search area and they were able to find the down plane it was it's just an amazing story and he got his name because the men later that uh, that week at a, a dinner they noticed he was kind of winking and it was out of stress and so his name went he went from being a number to winky because his little eye just wouldn't stop blinking <laughs> so it was cute but the only animal to win the Dickin medal during World War II was GI Joe and this was the only animal between the dogs, the horses, the cat that won the Dickin Medal. And G.I. Joe flew 20 miles in 20 minutes and stopped the planes on the tarmac from taking off to bomb a town in Italy that had just been taken over by the Allied forces. And he saved over 100 lives by stopping those planes from taking off. He was the only source of information that uh, he had. It was, it was just amazing. And so they flew him back to England to the Tower of London to receive his Dickin Medal. And those are the pictures down on the bottom at this phenomenal reception that this bird received um, at, this, uh, at the Tower of London with the bee feeders and the uh, generals of war. So these are some of the pictures of the war horses that served uh, for us in World War II on the Coast Guard. And up here, these three horses, Regal, Olga, and Upstart, are the three police horses that received the Dickin Medal during World War II. And they are the horses that controlled the chaos during the London Blitz. And it was amazing. I don't know how London survived what they survived uh, during the Blitz and everything. It was just a, an amazing period of time. And I think, honestly, the words of Winston Churchill held that country together uh, after seeing uh, a couple of those films. But it was amazing. But in the, we didn't have horses. We only shipped 49 horses during World War II overseas because it was hard to ship them and it was a lot of space and everything. And if we needed horses, they would be collected uh, or paid for over there. But they did use mules, in, especially in the China Burma Indian Theater. And uh, there's a picture of the mule being saddled up with, with stuff. But horses really were not used that often, except in Elizabeth Letts's wonderful book on the Lipizzaners being saved and stuff. Those horses 
that was quite a different, uh, a different matter. And here is our war cat, Simon. Yes, <clears throat> Simon. Actually, he's on the outskirts of World War II, but he's a cat, so he's a war cat. You know, we had to put him in here. But he was during, um, on, he was on a ship called the Amethyst that was going up the Yangtze River in 1949. And there was a conflict going on between the PLA and um, Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek. And so his ship was going up. Uh, the Brits were, didn't take a side, so they thought it was okay to go up the Yangtze River to relieve one of their ships up in a town called Nanking. But when they were traveling up there, um, they got shelled. Uh, by the um, PLA, and uh, the captain was killed, 21 sailors were killed, the, the ship was beached, and every time it tried to move, it was shelled even harder, and so it uh, was just a very, very bad time, and Simon was very badly injured during that shelling, and he, um, uh, but he came out, and he um, uh, was sent to sick bay. And it got to be, as he was recovering, he would jump up on the beds of the men who were in sick bay and start purring and kneading his paws. So he became a therapy cat. And the men just loved him. And uh, he also then, as he got feeling better, he started killing all the rats that were coming ashore because the boat was stranded for over 100 days. And the rats were coming on shore. And so from preventing them from the disease of the rats and killing the rats to keep the foods, the very low food supply, um, it was just amazing what, uh, what he did. And um, he's just this beautiful little cat that was just stowed away and uh, was a mascot for the men. But he's the only cat to have won the Dickin Medal. So all of these animals now, because I was so involved with them, it has now stimulated me to wanting to do something bigger to honor them. And we are now in the process of trying to put together the International War Animals Museum, which will be hopefully in Washington, D.C., which would be a place for people to come and learn about these animals for generations to come. And uh, uh, we're really, really excited about it. We're also gonna be doing an American version of the Dickin Medal. It's called the Animals and Peace Medal of Honor. We hope to be doing our very first medal ceremony in November of this year. So if any of you know of some really cool animals that have served in any way, um, even service animals, um, <coughs> But like police dogs or anything like that, please submit them to me. Uh, I'll have some information on that. And, uh, but it's really, really a, a, cool, um, a, a cool thing. And we're getting great response in Washington about it. So uh, I'm very, very excited to, to be doing this. So that's kind of a brief summary of some of the animals in my book. And uh, I'd like to just see if there are any questions. Yes. Dolphins were used. Um, I, I heard a couple of things. I don't know that much about the dolphins that were used, but I did hear that they were going to be used as trying to strap bombs on them and take out submarines. But that that became that that didn't work too well. But there was also some other kind of sonar thing that they were doing. But I honestly don't have enough information. Uh, about that to, to speak about that. But I did come across some, something like that in, in my research. Yes? After the war, they, they went back to their um, handlers that, that, that they took them. You know, the, the pigeons had to be donated as well. And so it's amazing. I just came across a book called Pigeons in Two World Wars. And um, this one guy um, who handled G.I. Joe and so many of the American pigeons, it's really, really something to hear. But, you know, these birds, they would be in mobile lofts, and so they would have to find their way back to these lofts that kept moving around. And so that was really pretty stunning. But um, our birds and the British birds went back. In Australia, sadly, they uh, were afraid of disease, and so they would put their birds down before bringing them home. But we, we, our birds that made it through were returned back to their, their handlers. Yes? He 
he would stay with the, the platoon. Um, in my book, I have some wonderful stories of the men who took care of her afterwards. And uh, it was really funny how people, they would get jealous of her attention, you know, if she found some people that she kind of bonded with over others and stuff. But she stayed right with the recoilless rifle people, the 5th Marine uh, in that area. And uh, so she was well cared for by our men. But, you know, they kept shifting on her. And so it was really nice for her to come and find a, a, permanent, a permanent home. Yes. Yes, the British, um, the British used, you know, quite a few animals. Um, uh, Antis was one of them that would fly. She flew, he, uh, he flew with the um, Royal Air Force. And um, it was amazing to see uh, some of the dogs. There was a para dog named Rob that also flew with the uh, Royal Air Force and he would parachute down. Bing was another one that was in there. Yes. Yes, they did. They did. Um, I did not come across any of their stories, but I did find dogs that they were captured by the Jap uh, German dogs or Japanese dogs. I, I have come across several of those dogs. The Germans had a phenomenal war dog program um, that was in World War I and World War II. So they were way ahead of us with their war dogs. But they really saw the value uh, of, those, of those dogs. We changed their names to um, Alsatians, or the British did, because they, the German Shepherd was just, you know, too red hot a, a name to call it, so they'd called them Alsatians back during the war. But yeah, no, the, the Germans, they had a phenomenal uh, program. I don't know in what capacity they use these animals, but I assume it would be similar. Yes, in the back. Yes, the, the dogs are used still today. Um, as a matter of fact, right before Reckless got her dick and metal, a wonderful war dog named Luca, Marine Corps dog named Luca, who served three tours, uh, two in Afghanistan and one in Iraq, went on 400 patrols before she stepped on an IED and lost her leg. Um, she received the Dick and Medal right before Reckless did, and we're doing our next monument is going to be for Luca at Camp Pendleton because that's where she was trained. But most of our war dog, our military working dogs today, are trained at Lockland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, and then they're sent out to the different branches. Camp Pendleton has a wonderful war dog program there, and uh, a lot of times after the war now, they're bringing these dogs home different from Korea and Vietnam and everything. They left the dogs over there. Um, but today they're being brought home and it's really nice because then some of them can be used in the police forces and they're used as police dogs or they're used, uh, they usually go back to their handlers or somebody else similar to that and uh, are used in different capacities or just retire. But uh, yeah, they're still, they're still used today and, and it's amazing what they're doing with these dogs. Yeah, Rob. Yeah. Yeah, did you guys hear that? He said he saw a statistic that 70, there's 70% fewer fatalities when the dogs are there um, on patrol and stuff. And yes, I have heard, I've heard at least that. That's probably on the low end. I've heard at least even bigger than that because they, they have such a sense of hearing and smell that is just incredible. I mean, they could hear a, a trip wire on, uh, you know, a, a, a a pathway just from the wind making a strange sound you know it's, it's amazing how they can detect these things it's it's phenomenal but yeah they're they're amazing in what they're able to do in the lives they save yes oh I thought you had a question I'm sorry yes back there you know the Bougainville animals they the only two animals uh, that were on Bougainville were killed and it wasn't on their own thing one of them was um, they were, uh, the Japanese infiltrated um, one of the camps and they knew the Japanese were coming, but um, the dog was, was killed in action um, at that point. And another one sadly was killed when he, he alerted to somebody out there, but because the 
uh, somebody new came into the platoon from the army and he didn't really trust the dogs and so he didn't believe the dogs point that there were Japanese there because Japanese hadn't been located in that area so he insisted that they go forward and so when they insisted that they go forward they were attacked and so the dog was killed in, in that action as well but those were the only two on Bougainville the dogs on Guam um, the second and third dog platoons um, the second and third, they lost 24 dogs on Guam. It was, it was very hard for them there. There's a beautiful dog monument there that Susan Bahare, who has done Smokey's uh, memorials, has done to honor the war dogs there. Um, I'm not sure how many um, other dogs um, survived because I, I was focused on just these several platoons, but most of the dogs um, were able to come home from World War II. And then today, I think a lot of them are, are saved and they do come home. Yes. Yeah, they, they would, um, it was really funny when I would read up on all of these and talk about the, um, the handlers and stuff. It's amazing how the dogs immediately bonded. They almost found their handler um, and stuff. And so um, they had one handler, uh, main handler. And sometimes, as I said, with the messenger dogs, they had two. And then they would have to rotate out. So they would switch off on handlers, but not at the same time. They stepped constant, stayed constant to the handlers that they had because they, they had to build that bond and trust and, um, and knowing that they could uh, really know what the dog was doing and stuff. So, yes, in the back. Are you familiar with them? Yes, I am. Yes, John Burnham. As a matter of fact, um, I was just at uh, the Dwight Eisenhower Library, uh, and I had one of the pictures of Chips I meant to point out. Chips actually has the distinction of biting General Eisenhower on the hand when he went to pet him. And that picture was Eisenhower kind of standing back after he bent over and Chips nipped him because he didn't know who he was. But I ran into John, and, I, and I, uh, I was amazed at that beautiful war dog memorial that he's built there. And I, and I told him, I said, you know, I'd really like to get Luca there. And so, um, because she was part of that, that whole uh, thing. So I, I'm kind of working with him on that. I just looked it up. I, I've, I've seen it. I hadn't had read about it. But it says, and you're looking for other dogs to honor. And it says that these dogs are associated with primarily with Vietnam, and that there are stories about Joe, Kelly, Bruno, Caper, and many more, and their handlers. Yeah. There may be some contenders. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While yeah. you're there, let's yeah. plug the National Infantry Museum, which is the, the art museum in Cleveland, uh -huh. is, the, is the second um, best free museum to visit, but the first is the National Infantry Museum. Oh, wow. Right there, so you did double duty. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Anybody else? No? Thank you very much for showing up on a cold night. Really appreciate it.